On February 1, 1968, the New York Central merged with the Pennsylvania Railroad, forming the Penn Central, ending a rail heritage that had its beginnings in 1853. The New York Central's first rails were a connection between Albany, New York, and the then Niagara frontier on the shores of Lake Erie. Starting from this modest beginning as a competition to the Erie Canal, the New York Central, under the direction of the Vanderbilts, Cornelius, known by history as the Commodore, and his son William, evolved into one of the largest, most profitable, and well-known railroads in the world. The New York Central's over 9,000 miles of track spread across the heart of the nation's highly populated and industrialized Northeast and Midwest, connecting New York, Boston, Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago, and St. Louis. Its rails went as far north as Mackinac City, Michigan, and south to Cairo, Illinois, on the Ohio River. The Central was a major mover of freight, but for most people it was identified by its famous passenger train, the 20th Century Limited, arguably the most well-known train in America and considered by many to be the greatest train in the world. It traveled from New York City to Chicago on what was advertised as the water level route. The New York Central, unlike its major competitor, the Pennsylvania Railroad, traveled north out of New York City to avoid the Allegheny Mountains, a decision that affected the makeup of its locomotive roster. Without mountain grades to conquer, the Central, during the steam era, didn't own articulated locomotives, and its diesel roster lacked six motor units suited for mountain railroading. Although commonly identified as the New York Central Railroad, its corporate title was the New York Central System. The New York Central System included subsidiaries, many that maintained their own identities. The Boston and Albany, Michigan Central, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Chicago, and St. Louis, known as the Big Four, the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie, the Toronto, Hamilton, and Buffalo, the Indiana Harbor Belt, and the Cleveland Union Terminal were all part of the Central. Smaller switching railroads like the Chicago River in Indiana, the Peoria Eastern, and the Louisville and Jefferson Bridge were also part of the Central System. In 1967, there were over 1,900 locomotives operating on the New York Central rails. The goal of this DVD is to provide a comprehensive look at the evolution of the motive power following World War II as diesel electrics replaced steam. Although the New York Central was one of the earliest buyers of diesel electric locomotives, acquiring the first units in the 1920s, it was slow to give up on steam locomotive technology that had been the mainstay of railroad power for over a century. Diesels were purchased in 1938 and 1939 for yard switching, but major acquisitions of diesels for over-the-road freight and passenger service didn't occur until 1947. In fact, the last railroad steam locomotive built by the American Locomotive Company, the largest of the nation's steam locomotive builders, was delivered to the New York Central subsidiary, the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie Railroad, in June of 1948. It took 10 years for the New York Central to complete dieselization. Its last steam locomotive was operated in 1957. Diesels from all five of America's major builders, the American Locomotive Company, known as Elko, the Baldwin Locomotive Works, the Electromotive Corporation, the Fairbanks Morris Company, General Electric, and the Lima Locomotive Works were on the roster. The detailed locomotive reviews will be by builder, divided into sections covering cab units, passenger and freight, road switchers, and finally yard switchers. Examples of subsidiary locomotives will be included. The review will begin with locomotives constructed by Elko. This section will review New York Central diesels built by Elko. During the steam era, the American Locomotive Company was the largest supplier of steam locomotives to the New York Central. Undoubtedly, Elko's most famous New York Central steam locomotive was the 464 Hudson. 
First delivered in 1927, it became the symbol of the New York Central Passenger Fleet. Variations of the Hudson remained in revenue service on secondary passenger runs until the end of steam in the 1950s. New York Central's last steam engine was also built by Elko in the years following World War II. When most railroads were moving towards dieselization, the New York Central still believed that a modern steam locomotive could be designed that would challenge the diesel electric. Central's last attempt at producing a competitive steam locomotive was the 6000 class 484 Niagara. Designed for high-speed passenger service, Elko built 26 Niagara's in 1945 and 1946, including number 6019. From a design standpoint, the Niagara's were successful. They developed over 6,000 horsepower and could haul 18 car passenger trains with a consistent speed of 80 miles per hour. They did in fact match the performance of the Electromotive E7 and Elko PA diesel passenger locomotives. However, there was no way to offset the high maintenance factors associated with steam technology and they were scrapped in less than 10 years. During the Central's transition years between 1948 and 1957, it maintained a close relationship with Elko and bought 770 diesels, cab units, road switchers, and yard switchers, resulting in one of the nation's largest rosters of Elko locomotives. The review of Elko diesels will begin with cab units, followed by road switchers, and then yard switchers. The New York Central purchased both passenger and freight cab units from Elko. Between 1948 and 1952, the New York Central bought 20 of Elko's PA passenger locomotives. 12 were the 2,000 horsepower PA and PB2s, and 8 were the 2,250 horsepower PA and PB3s. The passenger Elkos were a favorite among rail fans and were considered one of the most handsome diesel locomotives ever designed. By 1947, the New York Central had completed its extensive examination of the steam versus diesel controversy and committed to dieselization. That year, it made major purchases of diesel locomotives for over-the-road freight operations. Included were 67 1,500 horsepower Elko FA-1 and FB-1 cab units. These were followed in 1951 and 1952 with the purchase of an additional 130 upgraded 1600 horsepower FA and FB-2s. Visually, the FA-1s and FA-2s were virtually identical. The main difference, as shown in this illustration, in the FA-1 the shutters were at the extreme rear of the unit and on the FA-2 the radiator shutters were moved forward. During the early years of diesel operation, it was the New York Central's policy to group like locomotives together within the same district to maximize the efficiency of maintenance and operations. During the 1960s, New York Central's vast Collinwood Yard, located east of downtown Cleveland, was home to the Elko cab units. Central's main line heading east from Collinwood Yards towards Buffalo, New York, and west towards Chicago and Detroit were ideal locations to photograph the Elko cab units. It was the summer of 1964 when this film clip was taken on the main line between Buffalo and Cleveland. The Elkos at the time were 15 years old and their number was dwindling. Starting in 1961, the early Elko cab units began being traded in like used cars. The first went back to Elko for trade on second generation Elko RS32 road switchers. During the same year as the films and photos were taken, the Central would trade others to the General Electric Corporation for U25B road switchers. For rail fans that enjoyed first generation cab units, seeing the old Elkos running together in match sets brought back memories. Memories of when the diesel cabs were new and their efficiency helped drive the steam locomotives off the rails. Now the tables were turned. The hunter had become the hunted, and rail fans began to realize that first-generation diesels, like the steam engines, were being replaced by higher horsepower, more efficient second-generation units. 
This film clip of a four-unit F.A. freight rolling westbound into the Collinwood Yard was taken from a bridge that provided an ideal location to photograph mainline freights, switching moves, and the movements of locomotives in and out of the engine servicing area. The bridge provided an opportunity to take a relatively unusual top-down look at a four-unit set of F.A.s heading eastbound out of the yard towards Buffalo, New York. Elko's freight cab units were box-like in appearance and did not have the graceful lines of the Electromotive F units or the Fairbanks Morris C liners. They were, however, rail fan favorites. Many thought the reason being that they tended to smoke under high stress, giving the appearance of the steam locomotives they replaced. Cleveland wasn't the only location in 1964 where Elko cab units could be seen. Towards the end of the summer and throughout the winter, they were operating in the Chicago district. This photograph, taken late in August of 1964, captures a four-unit set of Elko FA-2s running light on the main line just east of Hammond, Indiana, about 50 miles east of Chicago. In another August of 1964 photograph, a set of Elko FAs are heading westbound into Chicago with a train load of automobiles. Later on that year, in early December, this photograph and following film clip captured a set of FAs heading eastbound out of Chicago. The freight is heading through Blue Island, Illinois, a favorite location of Chicago's rail fans. Blue Island was one of the best rail fan locations in a city full of railroads and good sites for rail photography. Blue Island is one of Chicago's southern suburbs and located such that five of Chicago's railroads, making their way around the southern end of Lake Michigan, came together just west of town. The Indiana Harbor Belt, a New York Central subsidiary, ran train after train through Blue Island. New York Central power was also evident on the Indiana Harbor Belt mainline, heading transfer runs between Central's south side yards. The BNOCT, Baltimore, Ohio, Chicago terminal trackage, was home to Baltimore, Ohio power, mostly EMDF units at the time, often with Chesapeake and Ohio units as part of the lash-ups. Out of the picture, but running perpendicular to the tracks in the photo, was the Rock Island mainline on a raised embankment an ideal location to catch Rock Island action and have a downward view of the other tracks. Before 9-11, rail fans could spend a day at the site and never be bothered. This illustration shows how the site is today, following all the mergers and consolidations. The Rock Island, of course, is gone and became part of American rail history. Its freight operations were taken over by the Iowa Interstate, and its passenger operations, the main line on the embankment, is now part of Chicago Metropolitan Rail, Chicago's commuter service. The Grand Trunk Western has become the Canadian National, and what was the BNOCT is now CSX. So the site is still active today. Whether the superpower of today's railroads is as exciting as the first generation diesels of the last century, is in the mind and eyes of the rail fan. The following year, in the spring of 1965, the FAs were still running in and out of Chicago. A four-unit set was photographed in April of 1965 in the New York Central Freight Yard in Riverdale, Illinois. It is interesting to note that the lead unit facing the camera was numbered 1119. That's the Penn Central renumbering of the New York Central locomotives. The FA-1 was originally number 1000, the first of the FA units delivered to the New York Central. The section on Elko cab units will end with this May of 1968 photograph. In early 1968, the Penn Central merger had been completed, and although for the most part locomotives had not been repainted, they did carry the new Penn Central numbering system, and it was not unusual to see locomotives from each of the railroads, still in their original liveries, 
working together, as witnessed by this photograph of an Elko FA-1 still in the New York Central paint job, followed by an Electromotive F-7B unit that had been repainted Penn Central, and the trailing unit is an Electromotive F-7A unit still in the Pennsylvania Railroad delivery. New York Central's roster contained 216 road switchers built by Elko. 14 of Elko's original road switchers, the RS-1, 23 of the upgraded RS-2s, and 135 of the RS-3s. There were also 9 RS-11s and 25 RS-32s on the roster. The last Elko road switchers purchased were 10 Century 430s. Elko has been credited with the creation of the industry's first road switcher, the RS-1, that was introduced in March of 1941 before the start of World War II. In response to a request by the Rock Island Railroad for a locomotive that could do yard switching as well as handle over-the-road assignments, Elko extended the frame on a standard yard switcher and added a short hood and road trucks. The result was a locomotive that met the Rock Island's criteria and became identified as the RS-1. Fourteen of the 1,000 horsepower RS-1s joined the New York Central roster between 1948 and 1950. Following World War II in October of 1946, Elko introduced the RS-2, an upgraded version of its RS-1 with 1,500 horsepower. The New York Central purchased 23 RS-2s. They were numbered 8200 to 8222. 8213 shown here is in the original as delivered paint scheme. Four years later in 1950, Elko introduced the third of its road switcher series, the RS3. It was the last of the Elko road switchers to use the original car body. The Central bought 135 of these 1600 horsepower road switchers. The early road switchers were not only used in over-the-road freight and switching assignments, they were successful in passenger operations. The New York Central did use RS-2s and RS-3s on secondary passenger trains and locals, mostly on eastern route. RS-3 number 8263 was wearing its as-delivered paint scheme when this photograph was taken. It was one of the RS-3s utilized in passenger service as evidenced by the exhaust stack coming from the steam generator that was located in this short hood. The steam generators were necessary for passenger operation. With the introduction of the 1800 horsepower RS-11 in February of 1956, Elko utilized a newer, larger, more massive appearing body design. In general, it became the prototype for all of Elko's following road switchers. 337 RS-11s were sold to American railroads, of which nine went to the New York Central in 1957. One of New York Central's RS-11s is at the head end of this three-unit freight, sitting in Dalton, Illinois, in June of 1965. The freight was waiting for a tower clearance to move in towards the city, so two photographs were able to be taken of the same train. It is interesting to note that the Big Alco was running Long Hood first. New York Central's next purchase of Alco road switchers was for 25 2,000 horsepower RS-32s that were delivered in 1961 and 1962. The RS-32s were Central's first purchase of what became known as second-generation diesels. That is, diesels that were purchased with the use of trade-ins for partial payment. As stated earlier, the trade-ins for the RS-32s were Elko FA-1 cab units. The RS-32s were the first locomotives delivered by Elko to the Central that came with a low short hood a design feature that was to become a standard of the industry. Three of Central's RS-32 road switchers were in this four-unit lash-up, sitting outside the yard in Dalton, Illinois, waiting for clearance. The photograph was another that was taken in June of 1965. The second and third locomotives in this five-unit lash-up are RS-32s. The freight is heading into Cleveland's Collinwood Yard, 
in the film clip shot in the summer of 1964. Only 35 RS-32s were constructed. 25 went to the New York Central and 10 went to the Southern Pacific. It is interesting to note that the New York Central purchased the first RS-32 constructed by Elko. It was delivered on June 21, 1961. And they also received the last one built, delivered on June 25, 1962. New York Central's final purchase of road switchers from Elko were 10 Century 430s, which joined the roster just prior to the merger with the Pennsylvania Railroad. Elko's Century 430 was a very rare locomotive. Only 16 were built for American railroads during its production run between August of 1966 and February of 1968. The 10 units that were delivered to the New York Central were the final C430s produced by Elko. The New York Central, like most railroads, purchased their first diesels for yard switching purposes. The first Elko yard switchers were acquired in the late 1920s. Other yard switchers were purchased from Elko during the 30s, but the first major acquisition of Elko end cab yard switchers occurred in 1940 when the first of the 70 S1 type switchers was delivered. Between 1940 and 1953, the Central, in addition to the 70 S1s, purchased 77 S2 type, 43 S3 type, and 43 S4 type yard switchers. Additional yard switchers were purchased for its subsidiary, the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie. Elko's S1 and S2 type yard switchers were very similar, the difference being that the S2 was turbocharged to boost its horsepower from 660 to 1000. The visual difference was in the size of the exhaust stack, which was larger on the S2 to accommodate the turbocharging. The S3 and S4 models were related in a similar fashion, the difference being that the S4 was turbocharged to produce 1,000 horsepower, whereas the S3 retained its 660 horsepower rating. This section will review locomotives built by the Electromotive Division of the General Motors Corporation, commonly referred to as EMD. General Motors began building diesel switchers in 1930, when it purchased the Electromotive Corporation and the Winton Engine Company. These companies operated as separate subsidiaries until January 1, 1941, when they were merged into the parent company. Diesels built before the merger were correctly identified as EMC. Starting with the purchase of seven EMC SC type yard switchers in 1936 for its subsidiary, the Chicago River and Indiana Railroad, the Central continued to acquire EMD diesels. By the time of the merger with the Pennsylvania Railroad in 1968, it had purchased 1,513 locomotives from Electromotive, more than from all the other builders combined. The review of these diesels will begin with cab units, followed by road switchers, and then yard switchers. The New York Central owned both passenger and freight cab units from Electromotive. The first cab units purchased were eight FT-type freight locomotives acquired in 1944. They were utilized in a lengthy evaluation program to determine operational characteristics and cost analysis. And although they did buy two F2s in 1946, it wasn't until 1947 that a commitment was made to dieselize over-the-road freight operations. Although the Central was slow in giving up the idea of modern steam locomotives for freights, in 1945, it did make a commitment to dieselizing passenger operations when it acquired 64 2,000 horsepower passenger E7s, 50A units and 14B units, delivered to the Central between 1945 and 1949. These were followed by 60 upgraded 2,250 horsepower 
E8 A units that joined the roster between 1951 and 1953. This first set of E unit photographs and film clips were taken from Chicago's Roosevelt Road Bridge overlooking the lead tracks to the city's LaSalle Street Station. The terminal the New York Central Railroad shared with the Rock Island and the Nickel Plate. The Roosevelt Road Bridge was ideal for photographing passenger trains as they arrived and departed, as well as the power movements to servicing areas. These clips provide an opportunity to see both the E7s and E8s. As soon as the passenger diesels joined the roster, they were assigned to the New York Central's most famous trains. In this 1965 film clip, the Central was being pulled by an Electromotive E7B unit sandwiched between two E8A units. This 1964 film clip, shot in St. Louis, Missouri, just outside of the famous Union Station, shows the New York Central's Knickerbocker traveling westbound into St. Louis from New York City, being led by a pair of Electromotive E8 units. Two E8s in the as-delivered lightning stripe paint scheme are highballing this passenger train eastbound through northern Indiana in this photograph and film clip taken in August of 1964. In this December of 1963 photograph taken in St. Louis, Missouri, just east of the city's famous Union Station, an E7A unit and a steam generator equipped dual purpose Electromotive GP9 are on their way to the engine servicing facility area after dropping the train off at the station. Before 9-11, most railroads did not object to rail fans being among the locomotives taking photographs as long as you were willing to sign a release form. Most rail fans of the day enjoyed being up close to the locomotive. Being up close allowed the rail fans to take detailed photographs of the locomotives such as this Electromotive E7A unit. Close-up detailed photographs were especially valuable for rail fans that were also model railroaders. It was the winter of 1969, one year after the Penn Central merger, when this photograph of an Electromotive E7 still in the New York Central paint job was taken off Chicago's Roosevelt Road Bridge. Following the merger, former New York Central passenger trains, now being operated as Penn Central, no longer utilized the LaSalle Street Station, but transferred the passenger operations to the Union Station in Chicago that had been the terminal utilized by the Pennsylvania Railroad. The final photograph in the Electromotive E-Unit Passenger Cab section could not be more fitting. A match set of ABA Electromotive E-7s running at full throttle along the water level route. In 1947, the New York Central purchased 50 Electromotive 
1,500 horsepower F3 freight units, 32 F3A units, and 12 F3B units. The F3 was Electromotive's first major upgrade to the FT unit. 1,107 A units and 694 B units were sold to American railroads. Electromotive utilized the same car body for its F-series of freight locomotives. In this pan shot of four F units, the third unit is an F3. The visual difference between the F7s and the F3s were that the F7s had a continuous stainless steel louver across the top of the hood, whereas the F3 had a chicken wire covering and the ventilator openings were exposed. The F3A unit looks a little out of place as the trailing unit on this U-boat-led high-speed freight. Electromotive introduced the next of the F-series freight units, the F7, in 1949. During its production run from February 1949 to December of 1953, over 3,800 F7s were sold to American, Canadian, and Mexican railroads. By far the most popular freight cab unit of any builder. Over a three-year period from 1949 to 1952, the Central purchased 293 of the F7 units. 238 were A units and 55 were B units. It was a rainy day in March of 1964 when this film clip and photograph were taken of an eastbound freight in Blue Island, Illinois, a southern suburb of Chicago. The first two units are F7A units, followed by Electromotive first generation road switchers. This freight, led by four F7s, was heading eastbound through Blue Island, Illinois, in January of 1964 when this film clip and photograph were taken. The F-7 was the last successful freight-type cab unit. By the end of its production run in 1953, the railroads were recognizing the flexibility of the road switcher. Although Electromotive did introduce an upgraded F-9 in the series, less than 200 were sold to American railroads. It seems fitting that the last photograph in the Freight Cab Unit series, taken in July of 1966, shows the F unit outnumbered by the road switch, which were already being recognized as the future in railroad motive power. EMD has been credited with the design and production of the first widely accepted road switcher, the General Purpose 7, introduced in 1947. 2,729, 1,500 horsepower, GP7s were built. The upgraded 1,750 horsepower GP9, introduced in 1954, sold even more. 4,092 Jeep 9s were built between 1954 and 1959. The New York Central was one of 108 Class 1 railroads that added EMD's early road switchers to its roster. They bought 228 GP7s between 1950 and 1953. These were followed by 176 GP9s delivered between 1954 and 1957. The delivery of these road switchers, many of which included steam generators for passenger operations, allowed the Central to kill the fires on its last steam engines. The Central continued to purchase Jeeps until the Penn Central merger. Five GP20s were added in 1961, 10 GP30s in 1962, 31 GP35s in 1963, and 105 GP40s from 1965 up into the merger.
Electra Motors' first four road switchers, the GP7, 9, 18, and 20, were built on the same basic car body. Rail fans of the time, as a way of quickly identifying models, primarily used differences in car body louvers. GP7s, as shown in this illustration, could be identified by the three louvers in the battery box area below the cab, and two rows of vertical louvers located under the radiator shutters at the far end of the long hood. These features were on both sides of the locomotive. This technique worked well for the first years after delivery, but as time passed, maintenance personnel often removed or relocated louvers, and only engine numbers were a reliable method of identification. First-generation Jeeps were offered with major options that changed the appearance of the locomotive. Jeeps equipped with dynamic brakes had what was identified as a blister on the top center of both sides of the long hood. Dual-purpose Jeeps designed for freight and passenger operations were delivered with a steam generator located in the short hood. These dual-purpose locomotives could be identified by the exhaust stack in the short hood. Another option that visually modified the locomotives was oversized fuel tanks located under the center of the locomotive's long hood. These tanks, utilized either for long-distance freight operation or as oversized split tanks for fuel and steam generator water in passenger service, by necessity required their air reservoirs to be located on top of the long hood. These units became known as torpedo boats. Rail fans of the time Many that had been in World War II thought the air reservoir cylinders resembled the torpedo tubes mounted on the deck of the Navy's famous PT boats. The review of New York Central's Jeep 7s will begin with this 1964 film clip of number 5621 running light through New York Central's Cleveland, Collinwood Yard. The locomotive was a long way from home. It is actually on the roster of the Peoria and Eastern, a New York Central subsidiary centered around the city of Peoria, Illinois. In the as-delivered lightning stripe paint scheme, subsidiary locomotives were identified on the long hood as part of the New York Central system, rather than the more typical New York Central. Number 5938 is a steam generator-equipped torpedo boat. On this August day back in 1965, it was at the head end of a passenger train working its way westbound through the maze of tracks that led to St. Louis's Union Station. This four-unit lash-up of first-generation electromotive diesels, all in their New York Central as-delivered deliveries, is hauling a westbound freight into Pittsburgh. The third and fourth locomotives are off-the-shelf GP7s, number 5711 and number 5787. This trio of Jeep 7s was photographed just outside of Peoria, Illinois in June of 1965. As would be expected, the middle unit is a Peoria and Eastern GP7. And as noted earlier, the lettering on the side of the long hood reads New York Central System. Another Peoria and Eastern Jeep 7 was photographed on the same trip, sitting among F units. There were 14 GP 7s on the Peoria and Eastern roster. The last photograph in the Jeep 7 section was taken in the summer of 1967. Number 5792, an off-the-shelf Jeep 7, had been in service for more than 15 years and still retained the external characteristics of the GP7, the three louvers in the battery box area under the cab, and the two sets of vertical louvers at the end of the long hood. There were 176 electromotive GP9s within the New York Central system. All but four of the units were delivered in the New York Central paint scheme. Four, 
number 5900 to 5903, were lettered for the Cleveland Union Terminal. The sun was low in the western sky when this film clip and photograph were taken in July of 1963. Number 6028 was running Long Hood first as it pulled this eastbound freight just outside of Detroit, Michigan. As soon as the GP9 was introduced in January of 1954, rail fans looked for ways to tell it from the GP7, which, as described earlier, was built on the same car body. Once again, louver placement provided the best opportunity. The GP9 had only a single louver below the cab, and in some models, none. And the two vertical louvers at the rear end of the GP7 long hood were replaced with a single and smaller vertical louver. Two early Jeeps are at the head end of this westbound freight, as it leaves Detroit, Michigan, heading for Chicago. The photograph was taken in the summer of 1965. Number 7419 is the classic off-the-shelf GP9. The lead unit, number 5766, is a GP7. It is interesting to note that the GP7 has been modified. One of the original three undercab louvers has been removed. As the camera pans GP9 number 7387, also identified by EMD as an off-the-shelf model, there is a better look at the identifying louvers. The as-delivered paint still looks shiny on these two first-generation electromotive diesels. Number 6058 is a GP9, and number 1655 is an F7A. They were the two lead locomotives on a four-unit lash-up hauling a westbound freight through northern Indiana in 1961. Jeep 9 number 7398 was the trailing unit on a westbound freight hauling empty auto rack cars back to Detroit. Detroit was the auto capital of the world when this photograph was taken back in 1964. Number 5989 was almost 10 years old when this 1964 photograph was taken. The as-delivered paint shows the wear and tear of more than a million miles of service. The New York Central in 1961 received 15 2,000 horsepower GP20s. Even though they shared the same car body as the earlier Jeeps, the GP20s were easy to identify because they were delivered with low, short hoods. The low short hood was possible because the locomotives were purchased for high-speed freight service and were not equipped with steam generators. Jeep 20 number 2125 is performing as advertised as the lead unit on an eastbound freight heading through Riverdale, Illinois. The photo was taken in October of 1966. With only 15 GP20s on the roster, and the fact that they were used system-wide, the chance of seeing one to photograph was, for rail fans, a relatively rare event. 
One of those rare occasions happened in the fall of 1964 when GP20 number 6107 was photographed in Riverdale, Illinois. GP20 number 2110 had been renumbered into the Penn Central numbering system when this photograph was taken in the summer of 1967. The locomotive was photographed on the ready track in the freight yard in Detroit, Michigan. Number 2110 was delivered to the New York Central as number 6118. In the last photograph in our GP20 series, we see GP20 6112 as the lead unit on an eastbound freight highballing through Riverdale, Illinois in June of 1965. The turbocharged GP20s are considered by many rail fans as the first of the second generation locomotives. With the GP20, Electromotive introduced the concept of trading in four older units on three just as productive GP20s. This program began the replacement of the diesels that had driven the steam locomotive from American rails. The hunter had become the hunted. Electromotive introduced the 2250 horsepower GP30 in October of 1961 and production began in April of the following year. The locomotive was an immediate success and many railroads utilized early cab units as trade-ins. A total of 945 GP30s were built, of which 10 went to the New York Central, delivered in 1962. Visually, the GP30s were very distinctive. They had what EMD called a skyline casing that ran from over the cab to halfway down the long hood. Many rail fans thought that the skyline casing gave the engine a top-heavy appearance. It was a warm, sunny afternoon in June of 1965 when GP30 number 6121 was at the head end of this eastbound freight, highballing through Dalton, Illinois, just west of the Illinois-Indiana state line. In another summer of 1965 photograph, GP30 number 6122 is seen here at the ready track in the freight yard in Detroit, Michigan. In the final GP30 photograph, also taken in the summer of 1965, two of the GP30s on the New York Central roster, number 6124 and a sister unit, are in a four-unit lash-up waiting for clearance to leave the yard in Riverdale, Illinois and head eastbound. New York Central bought 31 2,500 horsepower GP35s between 1963 and 1965. Electromotive built 1,280 GP35s during its production run from October of 1963 to January of 1966. Visually, the GP35 was significantly different from the GP30 because it lacked the skyline casing. Its distinguishing feature that identified it from future models was the three radiator fans that were mounted on the top end of the long hood. The GP35 had two large fans with a smaller fan in between. The radiator fan assembly can be clearly seen as the camera pans number 6125. In the following seven photographs, all taken in the late 1960s, GP35s are shown in operation at various locations all across the New York Central system. The last Electromotive road switchers purchased by the New York Central prior to the merger with the Pennsylvania Railroad were 105 3,000 horsepower GP40s. Visually, the GP40 was similar to the GP35. 
The main differences were that it was a couple of feet longer and there were three 48 inch diameter exhaust fans mounted on the top at the end of the long hood rather than the two large and one small as identified on the GP35. In this summer of 1967 film clip, five of New York Central's GP40s are at the head end of this eastbound freight. The three equal fan housing assemblies are clearly visible as the units pass. This section will conclude with a review of end cab yard switchers New York Central purchased from EMD. Although Electromotive did not produce the first diesel yard switching locomotives, it is credited with the design and production of the first end cab yard switcher. EMC's end cab yard switchers, designed for 360 degree visibility, mass production, and off the shelf sales, revolutionized the yard switcher market. On-site testing by the railroads validated EMC's claim that 50% savings on maintenance and 80% savings on fuel could be obtained by using their locomotives. By the start of World War II, EMC sales had tripled the number of yard switchers manufactured by all the other builders combined. The New York Central System purchased a total of 513 electromotive end cab yard switchers during the years just prior to the start of World War II until the Penn Central merger in 1968. New York Central's first World War II era purchase of yard switchers was for a 131 600 horsepower SW1 type switcher. Although all electromotive yard switchers tended to look the same, there were design features that helped rail fans identify models. Most common features used were the number and placement of exhaust stack or stacks, the size and shape of the radiator grill on the front of the hood, and the placement of louvers along the top sides of the hood. The SW1 had a single exhaust stack centered in the hood towards the cab, a half radiator on the front, and a distinctive rounded sandbox protruding out below the half radiator. SW1 number 8459 was performing switching duties in Chicago when this film clip was taken in the summer of 1967. Number 8459 was one of 14 SW1s delivered to the New York Central between February and April of 1939. Following World War II from 1946 to 1949, the New York Central System purchased 245 NW2 type yard switchers from END. 114 were for the parent road, and 37 went to the Indiana Harbor Belt, a Chicago area switching road. The 1,000 horsepower NW2s had two exhaust stacks, a half grill on the front, but no sandbox. As was the case with road switchers, external identification features were often modified during maintenance procedures. In addition, design modifications were made during a model's production run. Many yard switchers were delivered with multiple use capabilities so they could be utilized on transfer runs. In this winter of 1967 film clip, Indiana Harbor Belt 720 is the lead unit on a transfer run through LaGrange, Illinois. 8826 is the lead unit on this transfer run heading through Chicago's western suburbs. Film clip was taken in summer of 1965. Between 1949 and 1950, 97 1200 horsepower SW7 type yard switchers were purchased for the New York Central system. 50 went to the Indiana Harbor Belt, 7 went to the Peoria and Eastern, and 40 went to the Parent Road. The SW7 had two stacks, a full front louver grill, and as can be seen in this photograph of number 8888, the vertical louvers on the sides of the hood were in two sections to provide a location for the railroad's letter board. Number 8904, the first of seven SW7s delivered to the Peoria and Eastern, was performing switching duties in its namesake city, Peoria, Illinois, when this photograph was taken in the summer of 1964. 
As can be seen, the letterboard space was used by the New York Central system. One of Indiana Harbor Belt's 50 SW7s is shown here in this 1964 film clip, switching Chicago's huge clearing yard that at the time was the largest railroad yard in the nation. Between 1950 and 1953, 28 800 horsepower SW8s and 87 1200 horsepower SW9s were purchased by the New York Central system. Number 9008 was one of seven SW9s delivered to the Indiana Harbor Belt in 1953. Number 9008 was idling between assignments when this photograph was taken in Chicago in 1967. 19 of Electromotive's 900 horsepower SW900s were purchased by the New York Central System. 16 went to the parent company and 3 were delivered to the Cleveland Union Terminal. Number 8646 was the last of the SW900s delivered to the New York Central. It joined a roster in December of 1955. The final purchase of yard switchers prior to the Penn Central merger was for 22 1500 horsepower SW1500s that were delivered to the Indiana Harbor Belt between June of 1967 and June of 1968. The SW1500 was the last of the SW series built by Electromotive. Rail fans could easily identify the SW1500 because of the change in the relationship between the cab and the hood. The cab was raised to provide better 360 degree visibility, especially to the front of the engine. The SW1500 was the first of the yard switchers to be delivered with dual controls. Because the engineer could operate from either side of the engine, it allowed switching movements to be made with only the engineer in the cab. This section and a review of New York Central System diesel locomotives from Electromotive We'll end with this film clip as FW 1500, number 9215, performing switching duties in the Chicago area. It is interesting to note that SW 1500, number 9215, was the last unit delivered new to the New York Central system prior to the merger with the Pennsylvania. This section will review New York Central system locomotives built by General Electric. General Electric, although a major supplier of locomotive components and the builder of industrial sized switchers, didn't enter the over the road locomotive market until 1960 with the introduction of a road switcher identified as a U25B. General Electric did not manufacture cab units or yard switchers. In 1960, the General Electric Corporation, despite the fact that American railroads were at that time almost totally dieselized, and there was a stagnant national economy, and the corporation had no prior road unit building experience, introduced the U-25B, a 2,500 horsepower four-axle hood unit that General Electric described as the first all-new diesel electric locomotive in 15 years. Prior to its introduction, two General Electric U-25B demonstrators in a seven-month period, had run over 130,000 miles of track on 14 railroads, handling everything from coal trains to piggyback time freights. The U-25B could be purchased with a steam generator, gear ratios allowing speeds of up to 92 miles an hour, multiple unit controls, and dynamic brakes. In addition, the U-25B was available with a low short hood for increased visibility. The U-25B realized an almost immediate success. 17 U.S. railroads bought 478 units during its seven-year production run. The two biggest buyers were the New York Central with 70 and the Southern Pacific with 68. The New York Central took delivery of its 70 U-25Bs between 1964 and 1965. The U in the U-25B stood for Universal Line, as General Electric called its road switchers. The 25 identified the horsepower, and the B indicated a four-axle locomotive. Rail fans quickly substituted U-Boat for Universal. In this film clip, taken in summer of 1965, we see U-25B number 2524 leading a freight through White Plains, New York.
The New York Center was pleased with the performance of the U-25Bs, and a year later, in 1966, 24, 2800 horsepower U-28Bs were purchased. 22 went to the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie. The U-28Bs were delivered in the standard New York Central System paint scheme with the subsidiary road identified below the cab window. It is interesting to note that the U-28Bs survived on the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie through the Penn Central merger and the Conrail takeover. The Pittsburgh and Lake Erie finally became an independent railroad in 1979. The U-28Bs were then repainted into standard Pittsburgh and Lake Erie livery. The final purchase of General Electric U-Boats prior to the February 1, 1968 Penn Central merger was an order for 60 3,000 horsepower U-30Bs that were delivered between 1966 and 1967. It is interesting to note that two of the units, New York Central numbers 2858 and 2859, <laughs> although carrying builder plates identifying them as U-30Bs, they were actually the first U-33B production units. In the final film clip in the General Electric section, we see three U-boats wearing the Penn Central livery. Two of the units, the U-25B and the U-28B, were former New York Central System locomotives. The lead unit, number 2925, was a U-33B, bought new by the Penn Central. The 132 U-boats on the New York Central roster were absorbed into the Penn Central, and most continued in revenue service after the Penn Central became part of the Conrail takeover in 1976. This section will review locomotives built by the Baldwin Locomotive Works. The New York Central purchased a total of 99 Baldwin diesels, 39 cab units, 19 road switchers, and 41 end cab yard switchers. This section will begin with a review of the cab units. The New York Central roster contained three models of Baldwin cab units. The first to join the roster were six DR64 1500s, four A units and two B units, delivered in 1947 and 1948. Baldwin's nomenclature for its line of diesel locomotives was straightforward. The DR stood for diesel road unit, the number six stood for the number of axles on the engine, the number 4 stood for the number of powered axles, and the 15 for 1,500 horsepower. The DR64-1500 was a rare locomotive. Baldwin only built nine, seven A units and two B units. Six went to the New York Central, and three went to the Seaboard Airline. Baldwin's DR series of cab units also included a four-axle freight unit locomotive, the DR44-1500. 105 were sold to American railroads between 1947 and 1950. Four A units and two B units went to the New York Central in 1948. Rail fans, because of the units designed with a small nose and two wide windshields, gave these Baldwins the nickname of Babyface. 26 of Baldwin's 1600 horsepower shark nose cab unit, the RF 16, joined the roster between 1951 and 1952. There were 18 A units and 8 B units. These locomotives were built following Baldwin's merger with Lima Hamilton and carried the BLHW builder plates. In this photograph, we see RF-16 number 1207 as the lead unit in a classic first-generation ABA set of covered wagons. It is interesting to note that because of Baldwin's unique control system, Baldwin's diesels could not be run in multiple unit combinations with either Electromotive, Elko, or General Electric. Rail historians identify this fact as a major reason that Baldwin was was unsuccessful in its transition from steam locomotive to diesel design. The New York Central roster contained two models of Baldwin's road switchers. There were two 1500 horsepower DRS 4415s delivered in 1948 and 17 1200 horsepower RS12s that joined the roster in 1951. 
New York Central's two DRS 4415s were numbered 7300 and 7301. During the fall and winter of 1964, when this film clip and following photographs were taken, number 7301 was switching the coach yard outside of the LaSalle Street Station in downtown Chicago. The pictures were all taken off of Chicago's Roosevelt Road Bridge, which during the 1960s and 70s was a mecca for rail fans from Chicago and throughout the Midwest. It spanned over the lead tracks of four of Chicago's downtown stations, Dearborn, LaSalle, Union, and Grand Central, stations that handled all of the named trains that went east and southwest out of Chicago. Counting the named trains, the locals, the commuter service, the transfer runs, and the freights that ran under Roosevelt Road, at any day of the week there were literally hundreds of trains to photograph. The 17 1200 horsepower RS-12s, delivered in 1951, were the last road units the New York Central purchased from Baldwin. The next two photographs were taken in Cincinnati, Ohio in April of 1965. The first shows RS-12 number 6231 performing switching duties in New York Central's Riverside Freight Yard. The second captures RS-12 number 6232 as the lead unit on a trio of Baldwin road switchers hauling a transfer run. The topography of Cincinnati, built on seven steep hills along the Ohio River, made railroading difficult, and all of the major roads serving the city had at least two yards separated by steep grades. Transfer runs, particularly those running north and south, required extraordinary power. The New York Central owned 41 end cab yard switchers built by Baldwin, 12 VO660s, 8 VO1000s, and 21 S12s. Baldwin's yard switchers were the company's most successful diesel products. They were known for their rugged dependability and the ability to move heavy loads at slow speeds for extended periods. Yard switchers normally operated as independent units, so their unique controls were not a factor. Examples of Baldwin switchers built during the middle 1940s could still be seen in operation into the 1990s, 50 years after construction. The first yard switchers to join the New York Central roster were 12 660 horsepower VO 660s acquired between 1941 and 1944. The Central's eight 1000 horsepower VO 1000s were delivered in 1944 and 1945. The final film clip in the Baldwin section, shot in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1969 following the Penn Central merger, Captures S12 number 8100 performing yard switching duties. The film provides an opportunity to listen to the unique sound of the Baldwin Prime Mover. This section will review New York Central System locomotives bought from Fairbanks Morris. The review will again begin with cab units, followed by road switchers, and then yard switchers. The New York Central and its affiliates purchased 119 Fairbanks Morris diesels between 1946 and 1952. 49 cab units, 38 yard switchers, and 32 road switchers. Fairbanks Morris diesels were unlike those of Electromotive, Elco, or General Electric. They utilized an opposed piston design for the prime mover. The engine, developed for maritime use in World War II, was highly efficient and capable of developing high horsepower. Fairbanks Morris introduced 2,000 and 2,400 horsepower locomotives more than 10 years before EMD and Elco. However, the maintenance cost associated with these locomotives was significantly higher than those with a standard design. 
The problem associated more with the lack of training of maintenance crews that were not familiar with the design concept than any major flaw in the design. For whatever reason, Fairbanks Morris never became a major threat to the other builders and constructed its last locomotive in March of 1963. The Fairbanks Morris review will begin with cab units. Fairbanks Morris developed two series of cab unit designs. The first were identified as Erie Builts. They were followed in the Fairbanks Morris catalogs by their consolidated line of locomotives. The New York Central roster contained examples of both of the Fairbanks Morris cab unit designs. The first cab units introduced by Fairbanks Morris in 1949 were identified as Erie Builts because, for lack of production space at the Fairbanks Morris factory in Wisconsin, they were built under contract for Fairbanks Morris by the General Electric Corporation in Erie, Pennsylvania. The New York Central roster included 14 of the 2,000 horsepower Fairbanks Morris Erie Builts. Six were geared for passenger service and eight were geared for freights. Fairbanks Morris introduced its consolidated design of streamlined cab units in 1950. These locomotives were quickly identified by rail fans as sea liners. Fairbanks Morris designed these units to allow railroads maximum flexibility in acquiring a locomotive that matched the railroad's needs. The Fairbanks Morris catalog listed 14 different locomotive alternatives, all housed within the same sea liner body. There were 35 sea liners on the New York Central roster. Eight 2400 horsepower passenger units designated as CPA 24-5s, the only Fairbanks Morris cab units on the roster with trailing six-wheel trucks. There were eight 1600 horsepower freight locomotives, four cab units and four booster units identified as CFA and CFB 16-4s, and 15 2000 horsepower freight locomotives, 12 cab units and three booster units identified as CFA and CFB 20-4s. In October of 1964, the New York Central Sea Liners were assigned to freight duty in and out of New York Central's Cleveland Collinwood Yard. The authors of this DVD made a photo run to Cleveland to photograph the Fairbanks Morris covered wagons before they became part of rail history. The following photographs and film strips showing the Fairbanks Morris cab units in action were part of what was taken on that trip. Passenger Sea Liner CPA 24-5 number 4503 was idling near the engine house when these two film clips were shot. This trio of CFA 20-4s had just dropped off its freight and was moving light through the yard towards the engine servicing facility. This classic set of two CFA 20-4s had entered the yard with a westbound freight and were returning to the engine servicing facility area to await the next assignment. Note that the lead unit is still in the as-delivered New York Central famous lightning stripe paint scheme. This section will review of Fairbanks Morris road switchers operated by the New York Central and its affiliates. There were 13 1600 horsepower H1644s delivered in 1951 and 19 2000 horsepower H20-44s that joined the roster between 1948 and 1949. H16-44, number 7010, is idling on a rainy afternoon in another Cleveland, Ohio photograph of October of 1964. This photograph and following film clip, taken in East St. Louis on a winter afternoon in November of 1963, captured H20-44, number 7102, with a sister unit hauling a westbound transfer run from East St. Louis, Illinois, to St. Louis, Missouri. New York subsidiary, the Indiana Harbor Belt, a Chicago Beltline, had two H20-44s on its roster, 
number 7116, was the last delivered in September of 1948. This section will review the New York Central System Fairbanks Morris yard switchers. 38 yard switchers were purchased, 11 1,000 horsepower H1044s, and 27 1,200 horsepower H12-44s. H1044 number 8207 was performing switching duties at the New York Central LaSalle Street Station in downtown Chicago in 1964 when this film clip was shot. In April of 1966, the switching duties at New York Central's Buffalo, New York freight yard were being handled by Fairbanks Morris 1200 horsepower H12-44s. The next three film clips Capture a trio of the 1,200 horsepower yard switchers as they push a string of cars over the hump. An ideal assignment for the Fairbanks Morris yard switchers because of the high hood required for the opposed piston prime mover did not have the clear 360 degree visibility necessary for efficient flatland switching. Number 9131 was idling in the engine servicing area between assignments when this photograph was taken. The New York Central also assigned the 1,200 horsepower yard switchers to switching duties in the Chicago area during the 1960s. The section on Fairbanks Moors will conclude with this January of 1969 photograph of H12-44, number 8324, and two sister units as they idle in the freight yard in Chicago, Illinois. The review of the New York Central System diesel locomotives will conclude with an examination of those purchased from Lima Hamilton. Lima was the smallest of the nation's three builders of steam locomotives and remained committed to modern steam technology long after the efficiency of the diesel electric had been established. It did not develop a diesel of its own until 1948, too late to play a major role in the steam to diesel revolution. As a result, Lima built only 174 diesels before it was merged with Baldwin in 1950. The New York Central System was one of Lima's largest customers with 45 Lima Hamiltons on the roster. All but 16 were yard switchers. The New York Central was the only buyer of what Lima described as a 1200 horsepower light road switcher. 16 were purchased in 1950, all came equipped with steam generators for passenger work. They were used on secondary passenger trains and on local and branch line freights. Only two survived into the 1960s, number 6210 and 6211. They were re-engined with EMD prime movers and assigned to switching duties at Chicago's LaSalle Street Station.
29 Lima Hamilton yard switchers were on the roster of the Chicago River and Indiana Railroad, a New York Central subsidiary that performed switching operations within the Chicago urban area. The CRNI roster included two 1,000 horsepower switchers received in 1949 and six 1,200 horsepower and 21 800 horsepower switchers received in 1951. We would like to thank you for purchasing our film. We hope you had as much fun watching it as we did putting it together. As we have said many times in our films, we're not filmmakers, we're real fans that make films. 95% of the film clips and photographs used in our films come from our private collections. Each film clip or photograph selected brings back a memory of a time and place when rail fanning was an adventure. Back before the internet, scanners, and extra 2200 South, Every city or small town yard and engine terminal had to be explored, and every headlight on a main line offered the thrill of the unexpected. After all, back in the middle years of the last century, there were over 200 different models of diesel locomotives from five builders roaming the nation's 300-plus railroads. We realized that back then time was wasted and many trips ended in failure. But the thrill of finding a sought-after locomotive in a good location in bright sunlight still brings back memories of good times. Rail fanning for those of us who remember the 1950s, 60s, and 70s were times of change, and in the minds of most, not for the better. We realized from an economic standpoint, as a matter of survival, railroads had to merge. But to a rail fan, the loss of so many of our favorite railroads took away some of the thrill and excitement. The merger of the New York Central and the Pensy was a major blow. Two giants of this nation's rail history were gone. Their loss left a void that in the minds of the authors of this DVD has never been nor will ever be filled. This film and our next production, a review of the diesels of the Pennsylvania Railroad, are an attempt to recall some of the glory of what we consider the golden age of diesel rail fanning. It worked for us. Hopefully it did for you as well. Thanks again.